we should actually show that to you. So we're going to do that right after the break. And also, we're going to talk about pain in the neck. And that, that wouldn't be your significant other that's making a pain in the neck for you, but you're actually feeling that pain in the neck and how to relieve it. It's very important. So stay tuned for that. Remember, you're watching the Health Channel. He's giggling. All health, all the time on South Florida PBS. Please visit our website, allhealthallthetime.com, to submit questions for the experts or to find out more about the Health Channel. And we'll be right back. Dr. Fernando Stein, President of the American Academy of Pediatrics. Flood water may contain sewage or chemicals. Wash hands for at least 20 seconds with soap and clean water after touching flood waters, using the toilet, and before preparing or eating food. Do not let children play in flood waters or take part in disaster cleanup. Some toys can be disinfected. When in doubt, throw them out. Carbon monoxide is a gas you cannot see or smell, but it can make you sick or kill you. Symptoms of carbon monoxide poisoning include headaches, dizziness, vomiting, or confusion. Only use gasoline or diesel engines outside more than 20 feet away from any home, door, window, or vent. After a hurricane, emotional or behavioral changes in your children may be signs that they need help. Talk to them about the experience, reassure them that they're safe and it's okay to feel upset. Limit their exposure to media. If worried, seek help from a healthcare provider or clergy or call 1 800 985 5990. Hello, I'm Dr. Jose Sosa with Baptist Health Primary Care. Dementia is not a specific disease, it's an overall term that describes a wide range of symptoms associated with a decline in memory or other thinking skills severe enough to reduce a person's ability to perform everyday activities. While symptoms of dementia can vary greatly, at least two of the following must be significantly impaired to be considered dementia. Memory, communication and anguish, ability to pay attention, reasoning and judgment, visual perception. If you feel like you or someone in your family might be experiencing these symptoms, contact your primary care physician so that an evaluation can be performed. Dementia is not a specific disease. It's an overall term that describes a wide range of symptoms associated with a decline in memory or other thinking skills severe enough to reduce a person's ability to perform everyday activities. While symptoms of dementia can vary greatly, at least two of the following must be significantly impaired to be considered dementia. Memory, communication and anguish, ability to pay attention, reasoning and judgment, visual perception. If you feel like you or someone in your family might be experiencing these symptoms, contact your primary care physician so that an evaluation can be performed. Welcome back to the Health Channel, All Health All the Time. I'm Olga Villaverde, and with me today is Dr. Ronald Tolchin, Medical Director at the Baptist Health Center for Spine Care. All right, doctor, here's a question that I'm sure you get a lot, which is, what is the difference between back sprains and strains? The difference here is a P and then a T. Yes, let's start with the T. Okay. A strain is to the muscle. It's a sudden overpulling of the muscle, and there are different grades of strain. They're grade one, two, and three. A grade one strain is just an overpulling of the muscles, but there's no real tearing. A grade two is a partial tear, and a grade three is a full, complete tear. 
which is rare in the spine, but not rare in other joints of the body. So that's a strain, a muscle strain. A muscle sprain is a little different. It's not really a muscle. We're talking about ligaments that join bone. For example, in the knee, there's lots of ligaments in the knee, and those can be torn the same way, grade one, grade two, grade three. Um, but in the back, there are small little ligaments that go between the vertebral bodies that we'll show you. And those uh, ligaments could be injured as well, either overpulled by a sudden force or a fall or some type of trauma. So a strain is to the muscle with a T, and a sprain is to the ligament. Keep in mind that muscles also have tendons. When the muscle joins to the bone, it's joined by a tendon. So those are the areas that commonly are affected with a muscle strain. So it could be in, in the muscle or it could be in the tendon that connects the muscle to the bone. All right, and we have a 3D image that I want to show our viewers, and I think this will help you understand what is a lumbar strain. So, Doctor, what are we looking at here, and how common is this? So we're looking at the thoracolumbar muscles there. And we the have here the little mouse, if you want to use it, Doctor. Let me engage you right here, Certainly. and you can start pointing it for our viewers. There you go. So this is a very broad muscle. You can see it takes up most of the back here, the thoracolumbar muscle, latissimus dorsi, which goes all the way up into the arm okay and starts all the way down here and then you can see there's connections of these muscles to the pelvis this is your pelvis right here on one side and this is on the other side so these muscles are very broad when we talk about a muscle strain like we just brought up it could be anywhere within the muscle or it could be where the muscle attaches to the bone another large muscle we have is the trapezius and the trapezius takes up much of the base of the neck and all the way across the shoulders and actually goes down into the mid back so some people complain of pain in the mid back in here and it could be due to a strain of this trapezius muscle again commonly due to a sudden uh, forceful pulling of the muscle you weren't ready for it mm -hmm. and it was suddenly pulled or you were in a long you were in a bent position for a long period of time and suddenly got up quickly and those are reasons also to have uh, strains of the muscle and then keep in mind this broad sheath of muscle here in the thoracolumbar region. Thoracic for the mid-back, lumbar for the low back, thoracolumbar. This muscle takes up the whole broad area. And there's deep muscles to that as well. Great explanation there. Now, we have a model here, and I'm going to pick it up because I think this is fascinating, and I always like show and tell. I think from my school days, it's a fantastic way to learn. So thank you for bringing this in. We have symptoms of lumbar strain, and we're going to use this model to kind of explain what symptoms you might be feeling. So the first one would be sudden lower back pain for that lumbar strain. And you said what area was that, doctor, the lower? So that's going to be really the lower five vertebrae. And you can see here, this one is just above the tailbone the sacrum okay so five four three two one this comprises the lumbar spine but I showed you earlier that these muscles go all the way up into the mid back so a sudden lumbar sprain or excuse me a sudden lumbar strain could be anywhere from the base of the spine where it meets the tailbone and it connects to the pelvis all the way up to the mid back for okay. example and then there's other symptoms that you might experience which would be spasms in the lower back that result in more severe pain Yes, absolutely. So if there's a strain to the muscle, then that results in the muscle contracting and causing a spasm. So it's tight, it feels full, it, when you touch it, it's very painful, and then you can't move. And many people are bent forward because they can't straighten up because of the spasming in the muscle, not only in the back of the spine, back here in the lumbar region, but there are large muscles within the pelvis here that connect the spine to the base of the pelvis or into the leg and those are called iliopsoas muscles. Those are the ones that you bend with. And so these are really important too. And that's what causes people to bend forward when they're in a sudden spasm of the muscles. And then the last symptom that you might feel if you have lumbar strain would be the lower back feels sore to the touch. So even just a sudden little movement could be horrific. Absolutely. People can't find a position of comfort when they have these muscle strains. And so what happens is they're very tender. When they try to straighten up, it's very painful. And when they try to push on it or uh, they go to see their doctor and they palpate it with their fingers, it's very tender to palpation, mm -hmm. very tender. Doctor, I always love the show and tell. And Ed, if you could go back to that close-up, my director's always on standby for me. Explain here what these areas are, because I know these are very important. And here visually we can really see it to our viewers. I'm glad you brought that up, Olga, because these things are not done in isolation. 
what we're talking about now is muscle strains, but we also talked a minute ago about ligaments that go between the vertebrae and they connect the vertebrae together. And then they also around the front of the verte vertebral bodies to keep them stable and in the back of the vertebral bodies. But we also have these things between the bones. So the white areas are your vertebral bodies. That's the skeletal part of the spine. And then there's elements of those bodies in the back and those have little joints in them called facet joints and they guide movement. But then in between, this is a linkage system. You have to understand that there are discs and these are like your hydraulics in a car. It's like your shock absorber. So every time you bend, twist, move, these discs buffer that pressure and they take up the pressure of movement. As we get older, those discs start to dry out and that become a problem as well. Mm -hmm. But as we're younger and healthier, these discs are very mobile and they have fluid in the center and they work like a hydraulic system. So all of this works together. We're talking about muscles, we're talking about ligaments, we're talking about vertebral bodies, and we're talking about discs between the vertebral bodies. Fantastic, all right, I'm gonna grab that from you and then we're gonna actually take a graphic now and show our viewers a test that you use, doctor, every day for that matter, to, um, to look at the spine. So let's look at some of these, these are x-rays, you obviously use CT scans, um, magnetic uh, resonance imaging, MRIs, of course, um, that last one, radionuclide bone scan, and then EMGs. This is what you use to look at the spine, doctor? Yes, so these are some of the tests that are commonly done by physicians who you'll see in the office. The first one, x-ray. X-ray is very important to rule out fractures. Really, x-rays show just a few things. They show fractures, so if you're involved in trauma, the first thing that the emergency room would do or a physician would do would be to perhaps order an x-ray of the spine that's injured, okay? That shows you the area where the discs are, but it doesn't actually show you the disc, but it shows you the space where they are. It shows you any evidence of a fracture, and it can also show you arthritis involving those joints that I spoke about in the back, so that's the first test. The second test was the magnetic resonance imaging. And the magnetic resonance imaging, or MRI, is a great test. There's no radiation with that test, by the way. And it shows all the soft tissue. So it shows the muscle. So if you have a tear in the muscle, it could show that. If it shows, it could show a disc herniation where the disc actually protrudes backwards and it can press on the nerve. It can show the nerve actually traversing through the spine. And that's, those are the nerves that form the sciatic nerve that ultimately can go down your leg. And it can show all the soft tissues and swelling. An additional test is the CAT scan, commonly referred to as a CT scan, and that can show the bones a little better as well. Do you knew, normally know what a patient has before you even do these tests? Obviously you do them to cross your T's and dot your I's, but visually you kind of know? Most of the time a physician has an idea of whether this is a strain that we spoke about or a sprain of the ligament. Also, uh, the physician always or usually has a way to know whether it's more severe like a vertebral fracture where we would use some of these diagnostic tests. Sometimes we don't know mm -hmm. and we need other tests. So on the list was also a bone scan. And that sometimes with when people are osteoporotic, the bones are very thin, they don't show up well on x-ray. And so a bone scan sh can show you an area of a fracture. It can also show you an area of infection in the spine which can occur as well, but rarely. Finally, the EMG or electrodiagnostic test can tell you the function of the muscle. All the other tests that I mentioned are anatomical but an EMG actually shows you how the muscle is functioning. And it involves electricity, not uh, shockwave therapy, but it does involve a little electricity where we stimulate the muscle, it contracts, and we can measure that on a screen. We have a graphic uh, that we want to show our viewers of treatments in case you have a strain or sprain. And uh, these are just a, a few things to keep in mind. So let's go through them. Uh, rest. That's number one, that's very important. Ice and or heat applied to the back, exercise, stretching, education regarding use of protective equipment, and Especially when we have an injury to the muscle. And then finally, it's always about education. I educate my yes. patients, and we have to show people how to not get injured in the future, how to lift correctly, like you mentioned earlier. And then along that whole spectrum, we use medications, depending on how severe the pain is. Right. And some of those are over the counter. We have to take a quick break, but I do want to get to quickly acute and chronic pain. What's the difference, acute and chronic? How do you know the difference? Okay, acute is something that happens right away. When you touch a hot stove, you pull back. That's an acute mm -hmm. reaction. You have pain associated with that. That's a normal response. And that can last a very short period of time, but it can last up to weeks. When we talk about chronic, we're talking about pain that's not 
really protective for us. It's debilitating to us, and it it's usually starts after 12 weeks or three months, and it can go on sometimes for years, sometimes for a lifetime. We want to prevent someone going from acute protective pain to a chronic pain mechanism where it's over three months and it becomes encompassing of their lives, their families, and we want to prevent that. Absolutely, and I know this is a big question, doctor, but what's the number one thing you tell patients to do if they have a strain or a sprain? Big question, I know, but I just need a quick answer. Well, I tell them to be careful, initially rest, use ice, start stretching, keep mobile, as they can and we make sure we do that in a timely fashion and not too soon we want to prevent further injuries thank you so much all right so we're going to take a quick break we have much more to come we're going to look at stress fractures those small breaks that can be so painful so please please stay with us remember you can visit our website allhealthallthetime.com to submit questions for the experts or to find out more about the health channel right here on south florida pbs and we'll be right back When the waves swell, the wind blows, and rain starts to pour, you'll ask yourself, how prepared or unprepared are you? Did you board your windows, protect your home? Secure loose objects so they won't blow away. Bring large items in and low items up. If you're properly prepared, it will help in a big way. Does your family have a plan? Do they know what to do? Is your emergency kit packed waiting by the door for you? Just because you're not on the coast doesn't mean you're okay. Heavy winds and flooding can wash things away. When a hurricane is near, you need to stay safe. Turn on the radio. Wait for updates. Only leave your home if told so. Grab your bag and go, go, go. Now, if you're home and the heavy wind blows, get away from the windows, watch out for flooding, and protect yourself. You may be without power for a couple days, but your emergency kit should help you to stay. Once the storm is gone and it's safe to go home, be cautious of what's going on. If water's in your path, you have to turn back. Dangerous electricity and things you can't see can hurt you very badly. So before the waves swell, the wind blows, and rain starts to pour, get prepared, make a plan, and protect yourself each and every way. and misuse of antibiotics promotes the development of antibiotic resistant bacteria. Every time a person takes antibiotics, sensitive bacteria, bacteria that antibiotics can still kill, are wiped out. But resistant bacteria are left to grow and multiply. Though antibiotics are completely ineffective against viral infections, like the common cold, flu, most sore throats, bronchitis, and many sinus and ear infections, they are still commonly and wrongly prescribed. Smart use of our antibiotics is key to controlling the growth of resistance. It's estimated that of those patients who visit an outpatient provider in the United States, over half of antibiotics prescribed are inappropriate. <music> SCAD stands for spontaneous coronary artery dissection, and it means there's a tearing in the walls of the arteries that bring blood to the heart muscle. In recent studies, it seems to affect more than 90% women compared to men. It's a disease that is not well known, but the causes can include certain types of artery problems, such as fibromuscular dysplasia and other connective tissue disorders, as well as being peri or postpartum, um, and then other things such as emotional stress or extreme physical exertion. The main signs and symptoms are pres presenting with a heart attack and those signs are chest pain, trouble breathing, uh, any type of discomfort in the chest. Uh, people may feel lightheaded or dizzy or sweaty. And if you happen to have a predisposing uh, disease of the blood vessels, then definitely have a low, th low threshold to getting help. Thanks for teaching me about teamwork and leadership. Thanks for showing me that sports help me stay healthy and do well in school. And thank you for teaching me about concussion. Letting me know that I should tell you if I think I have a concussion. And how to protect my head and brain. Because one day, I want to be a teacher. An astronaut, scientist, or a coach. Just like you. Thank you for protecting my future.
Welcome back to the Health Channel, all health all the time. I'm Olga Villaverde and we're talking about your aching back. And with me today is Dr. Ronald Tolchin, Medical Director of the Baptist Health Center for Spine Care. Doctor, stress fractures is one or more of the small bones, right, that make up the lower back. And they're becoming increasingly common among adolescents and teen athletes. So what exactly is going on where they're getting hurt. Actually, let's bring the model up again. I always love using this, and I think it's fantastic to show what's going on with our teens and adolescents. Yeah, so thanks for asking. This is an area of the bone called the pars interarticularis, okay? It's a small area in the back of the spine, and what happens is when athletes hyperextend going backwards or rotate with force, such as lifting weights or gymnasts, or baseball players where there's strong rotational forces, this is an area of the bone that's very thin and it can actually get a little stress fracture. Sometimes it doesn't break all the way through, but sometimes it gets a little bit of inflammation in that area and the bone's about to break. It's important to recognize that early on so that we can use some protective mechanisms such as bracing for these. These are very hard to heal and sometimes they actually do not actually heal. They actually go on to form what's called a fibrous union where there's connective tissue holding it together. But they can be a source of pain if it's not recognized early. And speaking of gymnasts, experts tell us sports like gymnastics, football, lacrosse, baseball, and weightlifting can take a serious toll on the spine. Let's watch this and we'll talk about it right after. Perfect. Lumbar stress fractures are a common cause of pain in children and, and uh, adolescents. These stress fractures happen in the vertebrae, which are the small bones that make up the spinal column. Uh, these little joints here are called the facet joints, and they, they help in motion of the back, and that's where we're really looking for these stress fractures, and that presents as back, low back pain and sometimes radiating a little bit into the lower legs. We, we classify this as an overuse injury, uh, but we do see elements of weakness and tightness and variable in almost all these patients. Now, I have seen uh, gymnasts with six packs and really strong cores that still get it. So if at some point, if you stress this bone enough, it can certainly, it can certainly cause a stress fracture. I, I think we're seeing a little bit higher incidence of this is because pediatric population is playing year-round sports. Uh, they're specializing at a younger age, uh, and they're just being required to, to work harder and longer. And sometimes they play through the pain, or the no pain, no gain mantra in little kids I, I don't agree with. So listen to your body. If you're in pain, take some time off. Uh, and then it's also really important to maintain core strength and flexibility in your lower legs. If you have stiff legs, your pelvis doesn't move appropriately, and then your lower back gets all that stress, and those kids tend to have higher incidences of of these is these issues and let's add that in adults spinal fractures are twice as common as hip fractures and three times more common than breast cancer also spinal fractures are the most common in postmenopausal women over 55 in fact one in two women over the age of 50 will suffer an osteoporosis related spinal fracture in her lifetime now doctor I know you're in our 3d image wall explain to us why that happens is it loss of bone obviously Yes, so as we get older, what happens is that the uh, spine and all the bones in osteoporosis for some women, and which is very common, they become demineralized. The bones become soft. It's not in every woman. And it can also happen, by the way, in men. But they become demineralized, and when that happens, the bones are softer and are more prone to compressive forces. So when you, it could be something very simple, such as bending forward can compress the vertebral bodies right here, and they, uh, it, that's a very painful situation. And that Dr. is a fracture, in fact. And doctor, obviously everybody's different. Is this genetic related also? Because some women obviously don't uh, feel that when that pain occurs and some do. Yes, there is a genetic component to it. So many women will tell me that their mothers had osteoporosis mm -hmm. as well. So it's very important to help prevent osteoporosis. I'm amazed by the number of women that come into the office were never diagnosed with osteoporosis and then when we start looking we find that they actually have osteoporosis so a very important test is called a bone density study that women should undergo as they get older and certainly if they have risk factors such as a mother or a father that have had it as well since we have you there can you also tell us what a spinal compression fracture feels like I, I know it's hard to even you know but maybe you could paint the picture for us yes so it's one of the most painful conditions in the spine. It's a sudden onset of pain and it's very debilitating. You can't walk, you can't find a comfortable position and you're really essentially immobilized. And you may be in a flexed position forward like that 
um, uh, but you can't find a position of comfort. Sudden onset of pain after some activity. It could be something as subtle as coughing or sneezing in someone who has osteoporosis. It's important to recognize it early and get treatment for it. Go to the emergency room, go to the physician's office. We need to diagnose it with x-rays. And sometimes x-rays aren't even enough if the bones are too thin or brittle. You don't see the fracture. You have to do something like a CAT scan or MRI or even a bone scan that we mentioned earlier. Can you recover from that, doctor? Is it, I mean, it's something that where you could get back on track eventually? Yes, so mm -hmm. I'm glad you asked that. There is a great recovery for it, but we need to brace people and immobilize them. These bones take about 12 weeks to heal. So what I conventionally do in the office if I see someone like that is put them immediately into a brace. Hopefully, if they've gone to the emergency room, they'll do the same as soon as they diagnose them with a compression fracture. But yes, they do heal. Sometimes people can't tolerate braces for, because of their body habitus or they just it doesn't feel good to them and we use other means to heal those such as what's called a kyphoplasty where we actually inject a type of bone cement into the vertebral body we try to re-expand the vertebral body and that helps prevent further damage and it immediately helps with pain we don't start with that but it's indicated for someone who's not getting better or for someone who can't tolerate bracing for 12 weeks but that's the conventional mechanism during that time, we want them to walk. We don't want them to exercise, we don't want them to start therapy, but we do want them to walk, and as we spoke about earlier, getting that aerobic activity in and getting the stress back to the bone by weight-bearing, walking. Very important, not running, but walking. And always consulting with your physician, very important. Come join me over here, doctor, because I'm gonna grab this model again. You obviously can see I really like it. And uh, we're gonna talk about the fractures, the types of fractures that one can experience. I'm gonna name them, and maybe you could just walk us through it. Walk us through it. Wedge fracture, crush factor, and burst fracture. Let's take the first one, wedge fracture, and let's use our model to explain it. So the wedge fracture is what we talked about earlier with osteoporosis. It's the most common fracture. If you look at one of these vertebrae, they look kind of square and the height is the same in the front as compared to the back. With a wedge fracture, it comes down more in the front. It wedges down almost like a piece of pie. Mm. Okay, and the vertebral body starts to compress down and that's due to the softness of the bone, for example, in osteoporosis. It could be other serious conditions to the closet, but it's something that makes the bone brittle and prone to break. Now, a crush fracture is due to trauma. It often happens with major trauma. It can happen in a serious car accident, a fall, where actually the bone breaks. It can be a vertical break through the bone like this, or it could be a horizontal break, but it's not a wedge. It's a break in the actual bone. Those are very serious, and those may even need surgery. Um, Certainly, if it's not displaced, it could possibly be braced, but it's really important to see a spine uh, a specialist for that. The final fracture is called a burst fracture. That's the most serious. With a burst fracture, there's essentially a major force, a blow to the spine, usually due to a fall. It could be due to a diving accident where the bone actually bursts apart, and some of the bone could go into the spinal elements where the nerves are or even the spinal cord. It can be very serious depending on where in the spine that occurs, but it is a burst of the bone and it can displace and go into the nerves, into the spinal cord, very dangerous, has to be treated urgently. And speaking of treatment, I'm gonna grab it from you now and put it down. Thank you, doctor, so much for showing us that. You need to seek treatment. What can happen if you do not seek treatment? We have a graphic of your health and how it can really just start falling apart. And there's so many things that can happen. And I want you to touch upon each one of these, but l look at these. A misaligned spine can lead to health problems unrelated to your spine. Walk me through these, doctor. Yes, so if you're not treating your spine, um, this is gonna affect your mobility, your ability to walk, your ability to get out of bed, to exercise. You can lose balance for example, and you're more prone to falls. If you fall, you can have one of those vertebral fractures that we just spoke about, or you can injure another long bone, for example, your hip, if you had, for example, osteoporosis. It also reduces your ability to take care of yourself. So if, you're have a, if you have a spine condition and you're in pain, you're not taking care of yourself as well, and so that's very important that we treat the spine so that you can take care of yourself, dress, groom, your personal hygiene, and those things. Um, if you're spending time in bed, then you're losing muscle mass and strength. 
Not only that, you're losing bone mineralization that we talked about. So it's important not to spend time in bed. So we have to use sometimes medications to get people over an acute event, uh, an injury to the spine. We have to use perhaps bracing to, to get people up and mobile, for example, in a spine fracture. But we have to get out of bed and we have to keep mobile and that's really important. It's easier to lose strength than it is to regain it. So it's important to prevent it. Uh, finally, health all the time.